Well, thank you all. Thank you, Amanda, for a great presentation. Um, now I'm here to welcome Dr. Sarah Hayes, who is a senior in the Center for Health I'm going to tell you a little bit about her and we'll get started with her presentation. She received a grant from the Cosmo Club Foundation to conduct archival research in Spain during the summer of 2022. As a fellow of Community in Action, Tiana created the podcast Untold Histories of the Atlantic World, which focuses on the overlooked histories and experiences throughout the Atlantic World. Previously, Tiana was a fellow of the White House Historical Association, where she worked on the Slavery of President's Neighborhood Initiative, a program that we've actually done in the past and covered, and you can watch her on YouTube now. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay, for the very kind introduction. Um, thank you all, everyone, for coming out this morning to this presentation. I know some had to travel a bit for this, so I appreciate that. Um, as Lindsay was saying, I was a fellow with the White House Historical Association. It's a two-year-long fellowship. During the first, I did focus on the president's on slavery in the president's neighborhood initiative. And during the second year, I transitioned to kind of study more generally White House history. And so as a former barista and avid coffee lover, I decided to study the history of coffee in the White House. So that's essentially how this article coffee house culture and reflected popular coffee consumption habits. An examination of 18th and 19th century coffee consumption at the White House demonstrates how coffee became an important part of early American social and consumer culture. Throughout the presidencies of George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and James Monroe, coffee was an essential beverage that enhanced and complemented the social spaces of the president's personal estates and the White House. Okay. Coffee is a major global commodity that has impacted the lives of countless people throughout history. It is a beverage with multiple meanings and uses, its most common being its role as an energy stimulant and a signifer, signifier of social habits. The paths by which coffee came to the White House or the President's House involved in enslaved labor. Sorry, is there a ringing or is it good? Okay. Um, involved enslaved laborers who cultivated coffee in the Caribbean, servants, and eventually the executive mansion's occupants who consumed it. So, as Amanda so kindly laid out, um, this is about the history of how coffee ended up in the colonial. In Atlantic trade network. And the new In the New World colony, in the Dutch colonies such as Suriname, enslaved laborers, primarily from the West Coast, introduced coffee beans to Jamaica, where they were also cultivated by enslaved African laborers. And soon after, coffee became a staple commodity in the British Atlantic trade network. So it, although it was widely available during the 18th century, coffee did not get in popularity to the level of tea. Um, the coffee consumed during this time was not always the most delectable. For example, on February 5th, the drinkers could not distinguish from hot water end quote assumption but they were also central to male socialization and political dialogue coffee houses during this period also catered to the needs of merchants 
participants and traders by acting. They also provided services such as banking, maritime insurance, and public securities. During the 1780s, as these services developed into distinct industries, coffee houses would adapt to become more like taverns and inns. Coffee houses began providing food and drink items, and this did include coffee and chocolate. Um, and then they were also social and intellectual spaces. Um, they were places for discussion on politics, society, enlightenment, enlightenment ideals, and essentially coffee houses were incubators for the revolution. So before becoming president of the United States, John Adams viewed coffee houses as social and political spaces. Writing to James Warren, who was Speaker of the Massachusetts House of Representatives at the time, on October 7, 1775, Adams stated, quote, the debates and deliberations in Congress are impenetrable secrets, but the conversation in the city and the chat of the coffee house are free and open. Indeed, I wish we were at liberty to write freely and speak openly upon every subject, for there is frequently as much knowledge derived from conversation and correspondence as from solemn public debate, end quote. Coffee houses were spaces for men across social classes to engage in intellectual discussions and debates, but due to gender conventions at the time, women were often excluded from these spaces. Adams' contemporaries, including well-known names such as ben Fr Benjamin Franklin, frequented coffee houses where they discussed early colonial politics. During the 1760s, tensions grew between Great Britain and the American colonies regarding the former's reluctance to pay taxes on several types of goods. Um, and these included molasses, sugar, paper, and tea. And essentially, this led colonists to protect the protest these policies and demand proper representation in Parliament. So this dispute led to the, I'm sure everyone knows, the Boston Tea Party. On December 16, 1773, in which colonial patriots threw several hundred cases of British East India Company tea into the Boston Harbor. And this marked the beginning of a cultural shift away from tea, which reflected their British heritage. Parliament retaliated by passing what's known as the Intolerable Acts, which involved closing the Boston port until the colonists paid for the destroyed tea. In light of the economic warfare between the colonies in Great Britain to drink tea in Massachusetts or the colonies at large would have signaled one's political loyalties in public. The following year, John's Adam, John Adams began drinking coffee every afternoon and stated, tea must be universally renounced. I must be weaned and the sooner, and the, sooner the better, end quote. Although colonists paid important duty, import duties on coffee, tea more directly symbolized British culture. By distancing themselves from tea in favor of coffee, colonists demonstrated their plan forging a separate cultural identity around the beverage. So the tensions climaxed with the outbreak of the American War of Independence. Um, and when colonists altered their drinking habits, in a sort of symbolic pursuit, consumer culture that penetrated every level of society, even reaching the president's house. Various newspaper accounts indicated a popular fascination with coffee as many sought to learn the origin of the beverage, its qualities and its effects on the human body. So according to a 1786 Philadelphia newspaper, one correspondent detailed his prediction that coffee would, quote, diffuse itself among the mass of people and make a considerable ingredient in their daily influence, end quote. Coffee was also used medicinally to relieve headaches and to aid in digestion. Writing in 1788, the author of the newspaper stated, quote, I have observed that the use of coffee has increased from year to year day to day, and is still becoming more general, insomuch that the coffee planter need be under no fear or apprehension of failure in market or consumption, end quote. As coffee was imported in greater quantities from the Caribbean during the eight, early 1800s, more coffee houses were opened throughout the country, but mostly concentrated in the Northeast. At the turn of the century, Five whole years of American independence, according to the minutes from the proceedings of the House of Representatives on March 16, 1802. 
certain representatives expressed that why that while ship with tea was not only reflected amongst average Americans, but was evident in presidential consumption patterns as well. The beverage's popularity at the president's house mirrored the norms of etiquette and hospitality and consumption habits for coffee among ordinary Americans. So following the American War of Independence, President George Washington and First Lady Martha Washington served coffee alongside tea and lemonade at social gatherings and hosted, hosted at the president's house in New York, New York, and then later in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Following his second term, George Washington returned to his Mount Vernon estate where he received coffee plants for, for the first time from his grandson-in-law named Thomas Law in 1799. This coffee was grown and prepared by enslaved workers at Mount Vernon and typically served alongside cakes and candied sweets during the winter season at the First Lady's Levies. So you can see on the slide a painting that depicts Washington's valet, an African-American man whose name was most likely, I don't know how well you can see it, but he's in the back right corner um, of the image wearing a three-piece suit. So Shields and other enslaved workers were essentially the backbone of this household. When John Adams moved into the president's house in Washington, D.C. on November 1st, 1800, he brought with him his affinity for coffee and renewed attitudes toward tea. Although Adams incorporated tea into his diet after the war, he had come to really prefer coffee. The centrality of these beverages in everyday life is evidenced by the material culture. So Adams owned a silver plate neoclassical vase shaped urn made by English silver manufacturer Sheffield during the 1780s. And this urn depicted on the slide um, was engraved with the president's initials. Um, it was most likely acquired during his diplomatic trips as US minister to Britain, and this was between 1785 and 1788. Um, although the urn was intended to serve tea, Adams, who was a known coffee advocate, may have likely used it for coffee. So this repurposed use of the urn indicated a broad societal practice in the 80s, tea was not completely rejected, but rather existed alongside coffee. So perhaps the Adams were the most popular in America. Thomas Jefferson, however, preferred the quote-unquote genuine, well-ripened coffee of the Caribbean. Having spent considerable time at coffee houses, White House dining. In the Jefferson White House, enslaved African Americans were forced to labor alongside free African Americans and white servants to fulfill everyday household tasks. Traditionally, kitchen staff provided coffee and tea to guests in the oval drawing room after dinner, um, and that is today's blue room in the White House. Among the kitchen staff was a scullion named Sandy, who was most likely a free African-American man. The president paid Sandy $10 per month, and his primary responsibility was to supply charcoal, charcoal for the stew stove which, um, where the coffee was brewed. Such duties were essential to providing Jefferson with the drink he described as the quote-unquote favorite beverage of the civilized world. And it also allowed him to maintain a certain level of social prestige, which the beverage signified. On this next slide, you can see a bank draft for a coffee shipment. Before moving to the nation's capital, James Madison and Dolly Madison regularly enjoyed breakfast at nine in the morning, which consisted of ham or salt fish, herring, coffee or tea, and slices of toasted or untoasted bread spread with butter. The Madisons continued their tradition of serving coffee alongside pastries at social gatherings once they moved into the White House in 1809. 
So through Dolly's hospitality, she ensured that the white house was a place of lively political discourse for visiting guests. She hosted Levy's featuring live musicians. were enslaved African servants who set fire to the president's house on August 24th, 1814. The Madisons moved to a house around the corner on 19th Street and Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, and this was in March, 1815. And that's, this is where they remained for the duration of um, the presidency. So Dolly continued to host her leavings here, leavies here. And Paul Jennings, an enslaved African-American man, was likely tasked with setting the tables, serving refreshments during the Levy's, both at the president's house and in this new residence. Before leaving office in 1817, Dolly organized her final Wednesday evening reception, which had become the talk of the, the town. Coffee, punch, and wine were served to congressmen, foreign ministers, and employees of, lo of lower ranking government offices. And through their time in Washington, coffee was a central component of social gatherings and of daily consumption. James Monroe also enjoyed coffee. And like Thomas Jefferson, he had an affinity for French culture. On this slide, you can see the porcelain serving pieces, which were made in the late 18th and early 19th. And it even has her initials on it, if you can see. Um, also, if you look closely, you can even see the names of the first states. The cup and saucer on the right were part of a service that James and Dolly Madison purchased from James Monroe. And it features a monogram designed by Dolly Madison. And then on this side are two images of James Monroe's coffee urn. In, seven, in December 1807, he presented this urn to Captain Edward Howe, who was a master of a ship named Augustus. According to author Barbara McLean Warren, Howe had ensured Monroe's safe passage back to the United States following his negotiations in Britain over the Monroe-Pinckney Treaty. And Monroe may have also gifted Howe this urn because according to Howe's family records, he was a veteran of the Boston Tea Party. Throughout the presidencies of George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and James Monroe, coffee was an essential beverage that enhanced and complemented the social spaces of the president's personal estates and the White House. America's earliest presidents participated in coffee house culture and reflected popular coffee consumption habits. And as a, news, as a newspaper correspondent summarized in March, 1826, quote, there is perhaps no place where a man of the world can feel himself so perfectly at home as in a coffee house, end quote. Across the country, coffee houses were places where one may get a cup of hot coffee or tea at any hour of the day and thus catered to American taste by providing both beverages. In the legacy of the American War of Independence, the active embrace of coffee demonstrated political ties and coffee houses facilitated the affiliated social culture. As tensions eased between Britain and the United States, Americans began incorporating tea back into their diets. And this is reflected in the president's house, as well as in the daily consumption habits of average Americans who have come to balance their balance between both coffee and tea. Thank you. Thank you. So what kind of what size of coffee cup do they have? I mean, regular or um small and was it stronger? Like I yeah, I guess if you would compare them like based on today's standards, they certainly were not American sizes. They were probably most closely compared to European sizes. So like a regular um, like teacup probably is what they what they were using. Um, and they were probably drinking way not as caffeinated or as strong coffee beverages. Yes. You were referring to the fact that the coffee houses and the sort of coffee consumption was more of a male a white male thing, mm -hmm. uh, and, and women particularly didn't have the access. What about the enslaved? They're obviously part of 
the process of, of getting the coffee, but is there any evidence as to how much access enslaved or for that matter free blacks would have either during the revolutionary or, or early national period? So they certainly were not able to partake in coffee house culture in the actual coffee houses. Um, I did not, I was not able to find any information on whether or not they could consume the beverage, maybe like in the kitchens after all the work had been done. So I was not able to find any evidence of them partaking in coffee, but that's not to say that they don't or didn't at the time. Yeah, a lot of times the enslaved communities or free black communities would, would eventually evolve similar exactly. institutionalization. I just wonder if maybe there was a rise of even informal black coffee houses later. Yeah. Um, or coming into the army, maybe though the Civil War might be the time yeah. a lot of that would be a great research paper that I would do after this. So thanks for that idea. Any other questions? Question I like to ask during the research period. Um, what was an interesting like portion that, that you discovered during the research for this uh, paper in the book for my house? And did it tie at all into your research when you tried to uh, play your name in this neighborhood? Um, I guess. An interesting, um, I would just say the fact that coffee, because it is like, as I've been talking about, very important culturally and socially, that it really does come up pretty often in the newspapers from the time. So a big part of my research process was looking on like newspaper newspapers.com, which is through like the National Archives or the Library of Congress to find these digitized newspapers from the time. And the frequency with which coffee is mentioned and talked about and in different contexts, I thought was really surprising because I mean, it makes sense that if a historian two, 300 years from now were to come back and do um, a study on our time period, it's very commonly mentioned too. But I think we have a different level of association and it's reached a more like social, casual type of thing versus like when it was becoming pretty new in the period. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much. Okay. Well, can we give a huge round of applause for Tiana? Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, please feel free to take an extra piece of coffee of uh, coffee for you as you leave. I will point out real quick that I have given you all a chance to look at our upcoming programming for the rest of this 2022 year. Um, we are excited that on November 9th, we will be having women um, on campus at UMW talking about decolonizing education. Followed by Dan Williams. Where are we going to be for the number lecture? Live from the White House. <laughs> So please take a look. Um, if you're interested in becoming a member, um, we've also just an awesome little pamphlet here. You can apply today or take it home and send it to uh, well, yes, this is once again, Lindsay, our AV support. Thanks a lot for attending. Calling uh, our university teams can actually welcome people in person again, so we're very happy about that. And we hope to do more, but we're also going to keep some of that online programming, so look for that. Uh, uh, probably our Facebook page for that. Yeah.